Welcome back. Uh, all right, so for um, part two today, uh, I'm going to talk about cobordism maps in Hagar flow homology. Um, and on the course description on the website that Paul shared with you, um, there's some links to some references. Great. OK, so let's remember what we did yesterday, right? So to yesterday, we described um, our three manifold via Hagar diagram. And then from that Hagar diagram, we constructed a chain complex whose homology is invariant of the three manifold. In particular, the homology is invariant under Hagar moves. <coughs> um, great. And so uh, let me just remind you of some of the calculations from yesterday. Uh, so we computed HF minus of S3. Um, great. And we also computed, we computed this from this uh, genus one Hagar diagram. We also computed uh, HF minus of S2 cross S1. Uh, we computed this to be uh, two copies that I have to join you. Is the mic okay? Can people hear me in the back? Um, great, and we computed this from, for, for some technical reasons that I kind of didn't say too much about, um, we, had to, we had to make sure that there were intersection points here. Great. Um, and then if you want to label our generators, um, uh, let's say this is generated by, I'll call it theta plus and theta minus. Um, theta plus will be the one that's in higher degree so remember, the differential lowers degree by one. Um, so this one here is uh, theta plus, And then this one here is theta minus. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to erase Paul's announcement about the photo. I'm going to erase his wonderful little person running away. Um, so don't run away after this. All right, and maybe, maybe just I'll give you one more example. Um, uh, HF minus of uh, negative, negative one half surgery on the right hand except well. Uh, this looks like F will join U plus two copies of F. Uh, this is in grading zero, and these are both in grading zero. Um, Okay, maybe you're looking at these and you're saying like, oh, like, well, like, what are the options for what HF minus of a three manifold could look like? And then, and then you stop and think for a minute and you say, ah, okay, well, this is going to be a finitely generated module over the PID F or join U. <coughs> um, and then you, and then you remember, well, finitely generated modules over a PID are classified, right? They're a direct sum of um, free parts plus torsion parts. So, well, uh, F would join U is a PID. Uh, the degree of U is minus 2, right? So, well, yes. The question was, shouldn't the second example be the whole Hagar flow homology and not for just one of the spin C structures? You would think so based on what I've said, but I haven't said everything. So, um, so there's some, like, I, I, I sort of waved my hands and said, you had to isotope this to get intersection points to make it admissible. And then um, uh, for HF minus, it actually has to be admissible relative to like, the spin C structure. So for the others, this is admissible with respect to the spin C structure, but it's not admissible with respect to the other spin C structures. So you actually have to like isotope it more. Um, yeah, so, great question. Other questions? Okay, so, okay. So you have this polynomial ring um, that's graded. The degree of U is minus two. And um, Hager flow homology gives you out a graded module. So that means, well, Okay, well, what are, what are the only homogeneous, what are the only like, homogeneously graded polynomials? Well, since u is degree minus 2, the only homogeneously graded, graded polynomials are monomials. So in particular, um, 
right? So any uh, finally generated rated module um, looks like a direct sum of three parts plus a direct sum of torsion parts where the torsion parts, well, it has to look like f join u mod u to the ni for some uh, natural number ni. <coughs> okay, so, and so, so f, f is just f join u mod u. That's how that fits into this picture. Um, what else? Well, we know that um, if y is a rational homology sphere, um, Ajvat and Zabo tell us a little more. Um, they, in fact, show that, um, that you have exactly one free sum in. So if y is a rational homology sphere, hf minus uh, looks like a single free sum and plus some uh, torsion parts. Great. Okay. And so what do I want to tell you about today? Um, so today I want to tell you about uh, cobordism maps. Great. So let's say I have a four manifold W that's a cobordism from Y naught to Y1. So that means that the boundary of W is minus Y naught disjoint union Y1. Um, great. And uh, let's also pick a spin C structure on W. Um, so these are in one-to-one -one correspondence with uh, H upper two of W. Great. Okay. And then um, this will give us a map from HF minus of Y naught. And um, see, so if you have a spin C structure in the four manifold, you can restrict it to the boundary. Uh, so restricted to y not um, to hf minus of y1 with the spin c structure t restricted to y1. All right. And so I want to tell you um, how these maps are defined. OK. So um, well, again, like for the three-manifold invariant, right, we described our three-manifolds in a certain way. We described it with a Hagar diagram, and then from that Hagar diagram, we built our invariant. So for the cobordism, well, we'll describe our cobordism in some certain way, and then from that description, we'll build our maps. So, right, so, well, um, if you've seen some three-manifold topology, you know that, well, a Hagar diagram was secretly, it was built out of zero handle, uh, zero, single zero, hand, the way I described it, a, zero, a single zero handle, um, G1 handles, G2 handles, and then a single three handle. Um, and so the main idea is, well, W uh, can also be built out of handles. <coughs> Wait, so if we're going to build a cobordism from Y0 to Y1, we'll start off with Y0 plus I. Um, and then we can attach some one, two, and three handles to get to y1. Um, so, well, okay, we have uh, one handles, which are b1, we're going to thicken it up so that it's uh, four dimensional, and then this is attached along a uh, boundary of b1 plus b3. Then we have some two handles attached along the boundary of B2 plus B2, and then uh, some three handles. Attached along the uh, boundary of B3 plus B1. Okay. And so the way I'll define um, this cobordism map W is, well, I'll define it, I'll say what it is for the one handles, for the two handles, and three handles. And then since any cobordism can be built out of a composition of those, 
well, we just compose each of those maps. All right, and maybe I'll draw, I'll draw a cartoon picture. Right, okay, so um, we can start by attaching our one handles. Um, let's, let's say that I have L of them. Wait, okay, and then uh, it's an exercise to check that if you attach L1 handles, um, oh, can someone tell me what three manifold I'll end up with here? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, each one handle um, gives you a copy of uh, S2 cross S1, so if I have L of them, well, I get L copies of S1 cross S2. Okay, and now I'll attach uh, M two handles, and then let's say next letter is N, N three handles, next number is three. Great. Okay. Um, could someone tell me what three manifold should appear here? Yeah, because the point is, well, sort of, this is just sort of the dual argument to here is one way to see that. <coughs> Great. Okay. And, and if you don't see this, then that's a good exercise for you to think about ahead of the TA session this afternoon. All right. And, well, we, comp we computed, well, we did a partial, so basically did a partial computation of HF minus of S2 cross S1. Right, this is, uh, we have these two copies of F of join U. Um, moreover, right, on yesterday I stated the Kunith formula for you, so you could also, you could compute HF minus of uh, the connected sum of a bunch of copies of S2 cross S1, at least in the connected sum of all these spin C structures. Um, that's also a nice exercise to see what you get. Um, great. Okay, so <clears throat> let me tell you what the one handle map looks like. So this should be a map from HF minus of Y naught to HF minus of this thing. Um, Okay, so I'll do it for a single one handle. Um, to do multiple one handles, you can either iterate or you can also do it all at once, but um, I'll just do it for a single one handle. Okay, so this is gonna be a map. This is a cobordism from Y naught, let's say a single one handle. So cobordism map from Y naught to Y naught connects some S2 cross S1. And well, this map, right, so FW1, that's just the map induced by this cobordism. And, well, this just sends this, oh, I have some class X here. Can people see right here? Yeah. Um, this just gets sent. Okay, well, remember we have this Kunith formula that just says, um, you take this tensor product. Uh, maybe I'll put some spin structures in here. Um, wait. Well, this is just gonna get sent to X tensored with um, the top generator here. I'm, I'm just, right. so I'm just, I'm just telling you that this is what the map is, and then Ashwath and Zaba do a lot of work to tell you that like it all, everything works the way you'd want it to. This is just, this is just like a, a declaration. Okay, so that's the map associated to a one handle. Do they act, the question is, do they actually define this cobordism map this way? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, the show doesn't depend on like all the choices you made, and we're not going to do any of that. But it doesn't depend on any of those choices. <laughs> um, not that I know of. Maybe, maybe someone else knows of a way. But other questions? Uh, uh, louder. Oh, 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 oh. Um. 
this map is going to count holomorphic curves. Wait. Yeah, the question was, this map I defined doesn't need to count holomorphic curves. That is correct, but the two-handle map does. More questions? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so the question was, no matter what spin C structure you choose on why not you always land in here? And yes, that sounds right. More questions? OK. Uh, OK. Let's skip, let's, let's skip to three handles, because that's also easy to do and doesn't count holomorphic curves. Um, OK, and right, since, since three handles, I don't know, it's uh, similar to the one handle story. <coughs> Great, OK, so. W3, let's just do a single three handle for simplicity. Um, so this is going to go from Y1 connects some S2 plus S1, sorry, to Y1. <laughs> okay, and it's defined in much the same way. Uh, so HF minus of Y1 connects some S2 plus S1, S connects from S0 to HF minus of Y1, S. Okay. Um, so in here, right, um, again, using the Kunitz formula, well, elements here are, here are going to, um, right, we'll have X, not, X tensor theta minus, where theta minus is this, this guy, this here. And we'll also have things that look like x tensor theta plus. You know, you, you could have linear combinations of such things, but we'll define it on these. Um, and this map, okay, so it's here, it's basically, it, this map is just projection onto the theta minus factor. Um, so I'll write it like this. So we did one handles and three handles. Any question about that before we go on to two handles? Great. All right. So for simplicity, let's do the case where we have a single two handle. Yeah. Um, it needs to be a spin C structure like on the whole, on the whole three manifold. Um, the question was, what if it's trivial in S two cross S one? Yeah, yeah, uh, it's a, it's a oh, yeah, yeah. Maybe we can talk about that later. I don't want to get too deep into spin C structures. <laughs> um, yeah. So, in case it wasn't clear. Um, my mini course is meant to sort of like give, to paint like a broad picture of sort of how Higgler flow homology works. Um, I, uh, in three and a half hours, I didn't think I could sort of get into the details of, of everything. Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, so the question was, this map doesn't seem so well-defined because of how I've sort of chosen this identification um, via the Kunitz formula. Um, yeah, and again, I, I meant, um, yeah, you, there's a way to do it. Uh, I'm stating it this way just sort of, it hopes that it's sort of clear that the idea is you project onto one of the factors coming from S2 cross S1. More questions? Great, on to two handles. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so uh, again, we'll do a single two handle. Great, okay. So uh, 
let's say I have a two-handle, and let's say this is a two-handle taking me from uh, y1 to y2. Great. OK. And so this okay, it counts some holomorphic curves. This counts uh, holomorphic triangles. And OK, so how does it do this? So OK, so we'll have a Hager diagram that, that describes y1. Um, so wait. And it's going to be particularly well adapted to sort of um, how this two handle is being attached. So uh, it's a surface, a G tuple of alpha curves, a G tuple of beta curves, and a base point. Um, so this is a pointed uh, Hager diagram for y1 uh, such that, OK, two, two nice things are going to happen. Uh, so the first nice thing, um, uh, I'll elaborate more on this point because the way I'm stating it is not super precise. Okay, let's remove beta one. Um, okay, and then this is in some way is going to describe. Uh, okay, so let's say this is a single two handle. Let's say this is attached along a knot K in Y one, right? Because a two handle gets attached along a knot. <coughs> okay, so this is going to describe the knot complement. Uh, such that beta 1 represents a meridian of the knot. So let me give you an example. Um, and I also need to tell you how I'm getting this, this three manifold here from this collection of data. All right. So let me draw a Hager diagram for you. Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. Right. Oh, but. Yeah, so the question was, what about the piece in the middle? I described what one handles do, I described what three handles do. In the middle, um, right now I'm describing what two handles do. For simplicity, I'm describing it just for a single two handle. Um, you could either iterate it, or there's also a way to do sort of a bunch of two handles at once. Um, and that, that's going to be this count of holomorphic triangles in what's called a Hager triple, um, which, which I'll describe momentarily. Uh, oh. Oh, topologically, what's going on, right? So you have, you have y not connects on a bunch of copies of S2 cross S1, right? That's sort of like, that's what the boundary you've, you're seeing at that point. And then, well, you're picking some knots in that three manifold um, as for the attaching regions of your two handle. More questions? All right. So what I'm drawing right now is. OK, so this is meant to be, it looks very flat, but this is meant to be a genus 4 surface. So now I need to draw some alpha curves and some beta curves. Uh, so on my, right, th this is the, these are the genera of my surface. I've drawn four alpha curves, and now I'll draw some beta curves. And then this is beta 1. OK. So from this surface, um, how do I get a knot complement? So uh, well, um, wait. So on the alpha side, do the usual thing. So attach disks 
to all the alpha i's plus zero. And then you get a resulting S2 boundary, and so fill that with B, B3. OK, along the betas, well, here I said, I said, OK, so ignore beta 1, so we're missing a beta curve. We're short one beta curve, so don't, don't attach a disk along beta 1, and also don't fill in with a 3 ball. So now attach disks to uh, beta, one, beta i cross 1, where i goes from 2 to g. Here, i goes from 1 to g. Um, and then do not fill with anything. So it's an exercise to check that since we're missing, since we're ignoring one of the beta curves, um, the boundary that's going to be left is going to be a torus. OK, so from this description, so basically you take your Hager diagram. On the alpha side, do everything you, you're used to doing. On the beta side, ignore beta 1, glue in thickened disks along the other beta curves, and then, and then stop. And so now, now this gives you a 3-manifold torus boundary. Um, and so, well, it's a 3-manifold torus boundary. It's a knot complement of, a, of some knot and some 3-manifold. Um, great. OK, so that's... that's what I meant here. And then um, you want beta 1 to represent a meridian, right? So if you think about this beta 1, beta 1, if you think about it, is going to be a simple closed curve sitting in the boundary of the three manifold we just built. So you have a simple closed curve sitting on a torus. Well, you know, that, that's going to describe a meridian for some knot and some, for whatever knot you had, and for some knot and some three manifold. Great. OK. And maybe, maybe an exercise. Right. For this example here, um, this is, so convince yourself that this diagram describes the complement of a trefoil in S3. Complement of a trefoil in S3. And then if you want to get a gold star in the exercise, uh, you can figure out which trefoil it is, the right-handed or the left-handed. OK. Great. And so now but we also, OK, so we also want to have a Hager diagram that's going to describe uh, y2. Right, so uh, I have this two-handle cobordism from y1 to y2. I started off with this, ha with this Hager diagram that describes y1 in this particularly nice way that's sort of well adapted to the knot along which we're attaching our two handle. OK, well, the way I set things up, y2 is obtained from y1 by surgery along k. But we've, we've, we sort of can see the complement of k in this, in this diagram in a very nice way. And so now if you want to do surgery on it, or you just want to fill in that torus boundary according to the framing of, of this knot here. OK. So well, great. So the meridian no longer bounds the disk. Well, that's great that a meridian showed up in this diagram in this like, really nice way. So well, erase your meridian. OK. And now, well, on this torus boundary that you have, um, well, just um, there's a you can you can draw you can you can always find with the way things are set up you can always find a curve gamma that's going to be your uh, n framed well your well your framed longitude that's telling you how to attach your two handle so so let's define gamma okay. So it's basically going to look like the beta curves, except they're going to replace beta 1 with some other curve, gamma, that's the uh, framed longitude. So uh, we have gamma 1. And then the, we'll keep the betas. Um, for technical reasons, we'll isotope them slightly. Uh, that's what the primes mean. OK, so this is going to be so where gamma 1 describes 
uh, the framing of the two handle and uh, beta i prime is a small translate of beta i. <coughs> okay, so wait, so now we have um, yes, maybe maybe in this example here, um, I'll draw an example of gamma of this gamma one. I'm drawing this in green. I don't know if it looks green to anyone in the audience. Okay, and then uh, the other, so this is gamma one, this is green. And then the other gammas are just are basically the other blue curves here, but I'm not gonna draw translates of them because the diagram will get terrible looking. Okay, so the point is we have a single surface. We have alpha curves, beta curves, and gamma curves. Oh, right, so gamma one, oh, right, <laughs> great. The question was how do, how do we determine what gamma one is? Right, so um, right, according to this recipe, right, you get a three manifold whose um, boundary is a torus, and gamma one should be the framing, uh, is given, determined by the framing of the two handle. So I haven't really said the details, so I guarantee that you can always, that this curve is always going to live on the Hager surface and not like go across some of the, of the beta handles. But, but it's true, you, yeah, you can always draw this, um, yeah, sort of this framing for the, for the knot on the Hager surface, and that's going to be your gamma one. Other questions? Great. Okay, so... We have, a, okay, we have a surface, we have this alpha curves that stayed the same throughout. We had this beta curves where beta one was a meridian. And then we had these gamma curves that were basically beta, but we traded out the meridian of our knot for this framed longitude that's telling us how to attach our two handle. Okay. So from this data, we can get out actually three different Hagar diagrams, right? H alpha beta. That's just going to be sigma with using the alpha curves. We can get H uh, alpha gamma. That's using the alpha and gamma curves. And we can get out H, what's left? Beta gamma, beta gamma. Great. OK. Um, Great. Okay. Well, this one, right? Well, just this is what we started with. This describes y1. This one, right? Since y1, since y2 is obtained um, by surgery on this knot k and y1, well, this one describes y2. Um, great. And I'll leave it as an exercise for you to. Uh, figure out what, uh, I'll, just, I'll just tell you. Right, this one is going to describe a connect sum of g minus 1 copies of S2 uh, plus S1. So maybe, maybe an exercise is to convince yourself of this. Maybe, maybe as a hint for this S2 cross S1 bit, Remember yesterday, someone asked, okay, well, if you have a Hagar diagram where the beta curves are all just equal to the alpha curves, what is that going to describe? Okay. All right. So, 
Now what happens? OK, so this, this data, um, we're going to call it a Hager triple because we have three sets of curves, alpha, beta, gamma. Oh, which, this one? The, yeah, the question was, the last one doesn't depend on the framing that you had on the knot. Um, and the answer is no, right? This, this framing is coming from a two-handle attachment. Um, so uh, it's always going to be integral. So in particular, um, you can, right, if you looked, if I had kept beta 1 here, uh, I'll, I'll isotope it slightly and I'll, I'll put it here. Um, so in particular, what it, since the, it was always an integrally framed two-handle, the beta 1 and gamma 1 are always going to intersect once. That sort of comes from the setup. And then, um, and then well, all the other curves are just, all the other beta and gamma curves are isotopic to one another. And that's enough to, to determine this. Great question. Other questions? OK. So we have this thing called a Hager triple. A base point everywhere. OK, so now we'll define this map f alpha, beta, gamma from, OK, so it's going to go from Cf minus of h alpha, beta to Cf minus, oh, no, there's a tensor, tensored with uh, Cf minus of h alpha, gamma. Mm. Alpha gamma. Uh, okay. Uh, I, this should be beta gamma to CF minus of H alpha gamma. Great. Okay, and this map um, counts holomorphic triangles. Great. Okay, so this map is defined. Okay, so it's going to take in uh, the tensor product of two generators, and then okay, so then you sum over all z that are generators here. So generators here are intersection points between T alpha and T gamma. OK. And then we're going to sum over uh, psi and pi 2 of x, y, z. So this is um, pi 2 of x, y, z is uh, homotopy classes of triangles uh, connecting x, y, and z. Um, there's some index requirement on the triangles. They should have index 0. And then you're counting points in the moduli space of um, such triangles. Uh, and then, as usual, you count intersection points at the base point with powers of u, and then you get a z here. OK, so basically, it's kind of like the disks from yesterday, but now there's triangles, so they go from three things. So what do, what do, what do these triangles have to look like? Wait, um, I'm going to use colors that may or may not be visible to the audience. So this is red, this is blue, this is green, this is x, this is y, y is beta gamma. 
and Z is alpha gamma, right? Alphas are always red, betas are always blue, and gammas are going to be green. So, so it's the same sort of deal as where you're like looking for certain triangles where like this is the source and like it has to map in such that the decorations match up so that like this should go to an alpha curve, this should go to a beta curve, and this should go to a gamma curve. Um, and uh, maybe, for, maybe for technical reasons, you should also split this along spin C structures. Um, so uh, the small print is that for technical reasons, um, yeah, you should split along, you should split this along spin C structures. Okay, so let me give you an example. Um, yes. Ah, the question was, should it be a... Great. Yeah, the question was, should there be a hat over my moduli space? Um, and the answer is no. Right, so remember yesterday we looked for um, index one disks and we modded up by this R action. Um, for the, here we're looking for index zero things, so this is already going to be a zero dimensional moduli space, so, we're, so this really is counting points already. And it has to do with sort of that, that your disk had this translation by R, but the triangle doesn't. Um, great question. More questions? All right, okay. Let's draw an example. Um, it's gonna be a genus one example. Um, great, okay, so this is a torus. Uh, opposite sides are identified. Uh, here's my alpha curve. Here's my beta curve. And then here's my gamma curve. Okay. So, great, so x, should, x is going to be an intersection point between alpha and, and beta, so there's only one choice for x. Y is an intersection point between beta and gamma, so there's only one choice for y. Great, okay, and then, well, we're looking for uh, some triangles where the, the colors match, right, so, well, Here's a triangle where the decorations all match, right? So let's call this Z1. Um, great, and uh, this is on a torus, so there's also a bigger triangle, right, than if you kept going here and then came down here like this to Z2. Great. Um, okay, so this is saying that in this example, well, F alpha beta gamma, of x tensor y, um, it's z1 plus z2. Oh, there's a base point somewhere, but I'll put my base point on here. Um, great, uh, I'm sort of not saying much about spin C structures. It turns out that these two triangles actually live in different spin C structures. Um, the, the two triangles live in different structures. Um, Okay, and so, wait, and so, uh, can, can you speak up? Can, oh, but the question is about the spin C structures. Yeah, I sort of don't want to get into that. That's the theme, <laughs> sorry. Other questions? <laughs> yeah, great, yeah. I mean, for, for three manifolds, you can think about them as non-vanishing vector fields up to a certain equivalence. But, um, great. Okay. So to find this map, F alpha beta gamma, and so now that's basically the key ingredient needed to define this two-handle map. Yes. Does 
are there other triangles, but those triangles don't have mu equal to zero? Oh, oh, um, like here? Maybe I'll put my, uh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, no. I'd actually, I didn't find all the triangles. Thanks. The question was, are there other triangles but they don't have mu equal to zero? And the question, the answer is, there are other triangles that I was sloppy when I was preparing my notes. So, great. Um, sort of, for genus one, you sort of, you want triangles that sort of like look nice like this. Yeah, so plus, yeah, so, thanks. Um, great, so. Uh, I'll say that the, these two triangles are in different spin C structures and um, plus similar. Maybe the, yeah, sort of the point of this example was to sort of show you what a triangle looks like, but I was careless and didn't find them all. Oh. Right, so the question, what would happen if I chose beta 2? Yeah, so the, the point was that this diagram, we started with this diagram for y1, where beta 1 was a meridian. Um, if you chose some other curve, well, that's going to that's gonna be some meridian of some probably different knot in y1. So you could do this with any of the, of the beta curves, um, and it's going to be some two-handle attachment. Um, uh, oh, well, so if you do it for a different beta, will the mass be related? Um, it, in general, like if you chose a different beta, in general, it's going to be a different knot in Y. So in general, it's going to be a different nap because it's a different, some different two-handle um, cobordism. Do we require beta 1 to be just like this? Um, no. So sort of, it was drawn in that way because if you sort of, the diagram that I drew, um, you can see that as like a complement of a knot in S3 in a particularly nice way. So it's particularly clear that that's a meridian for that knot. But any, any beta curve in any Hager diagram is going to be the meridian of some knot in that three manifold. More questions? Um, I, yes, the, the question was, is there sort of a nice way to count triangles in a genus one diagram? And I want to say just sort of if they just sort of look like, you, as Josh said, um, if you go to the universal cover, um, you just sort of look for like triangles that just like look like, look like this one, like the corner should all be acute. Um, I think, think that should be it, but this, yeah. Yeah, something like that. Great. All right. OK. So to find this map from here to here, but this, the two-handle map should go from y1 to y2. So we're almost there. So um, the, my, my, my two-handle cobordism I called w2, I think, way back when. So this two-handle map uh, from hf minus of y1 to hf minus of y2, well, it's just defined by, um, it sends x to uh, f alpha beta gamma of x tensored with, well, remember, beta gamma describes, uh, connects some of S2 cross S1s. So um, and if, if you worked out with the Kunis formula, what that looks like, there's going to be a unique um, top graded element in there. Uh, so take this tensor with theta plus, right? So if, if, if this is a single copy of S2 cross S1, then this is the exact same theta plus that we had earlier. And then if it's a bunch of copies, then it's just the unique top graded element. So top graded element. Wait. 
OK, so great. We've described the maps for one handles, two handles, and three handles. So you have a cobordism built out of those. And um, this is going to be the composition of those. And then Ashraf and Sabo did a lot of work to show that um, this is well defined and doesn't, doesn't, in particular, doesn't depend on any of the choices um, that we made. Uh, may, great. And so, um, yeah, uh, maybe, you're, maybe you're curious about the gradings, how this map is graded. Um, very roughly, this map splits along spin-C structures along your cobordism. And within each spin-C structure, there's um, a well-defined uh, grading shift that's determined by some um, topological data associated to your, your four-manifold and your choice of spin-C structure. <coughs> All right. Questions? Yes. Um, the question was about doing this in practice. Um, I actually don't usually do this in practice from the definition. <laughs> Maybe there's some people who do, but um, like for like for there's lots of nice tricks to compute this without actually counting holomorphic triangles. It's nice to know the counts exist and that they make everything work, but I don't ever actually do it that way. Um, other questions? Okay. Great. So the goal of whole, this whole discussion was to give you an idea of how the cobordism maps are defined. Um, but maybe from, from my point of view, I'm used, I'm, my goal is to use this tool to study low dimensional topology. And so like, for example, one thing I care about is something called homology cobordism. And so how can these cobordism maps be used to study homology cobordism? And so sort of the main idea, and so, so if I lost you with the counts of holomorphic triangles, maybe what you should take from the past 50 minutes of this discussion is that there's a way to define these cobordism maps on uh, Higgard flow homology, and it's well-defined, and it works. But now, sort of for applications, well, maybe one main idea to, for me is that um, nice cobordisms uh, induce nice maps on uh, Hager flow homology. Great. OK. So um, what's, there's many particular nice cobordisms out there. Uh, one particularly nice kind of cobordism that I like is something called a homology cobordism. So definition, uh, we say that uh, W, uh, uh, OK, so my four manifold is going to be smooth and compact. So a smooth, compact four manifold W is a homology cobordism from Y naught to Y one if okay, so it should be a cobordism from y naught to y1. So the boundary should be minus y naught disjoint union y1. That's the cobordism part. And then the homology part um, should be is that w should look like a product on the level of homology. So one way of saying that is that the map induced by inclusion um, from the homology of one of the boundary components to the homology of w, uh, this should be an isomorphism. OK. Um, and then we say, uh, we write this, um, we denote this by, I'll just denote it with a tilde. Um, so in particular, uh, this is an equivalence relation on three manifolds. That's a nice exercise to check. All right. So 
uh, what are some examples of homology cobordisms? Well, I said the hom a homology cobordism looks like a product on the level of homology. So uh, one example is, well, W equals Y plus I is a homology cobordism from Y to itself. And maybe another example um, is that if Y is an integer homology sphere, uh, W, uh, if you take Y minus a three ball and cross it with I and then remove a four ball, this is a homology cobordism. Well, this part, you can check the boundary is going to be y connects on minus y. And this part, the boundary is going to be S3. Um, so it's homology cobordism from uh, y connects on minus y to S3. OK, so questions? Yes. Oh, can I draw a picture of this? I can draw a cartoon of this, right? So. Here's y. Here's, I took out a three ball. Now I cross it with i. Um, so this is going to be minus y. This part gets realized as the connected sum. So this gives us y connects sum minus y. That's coming from this part. And then you just remove a four ball f from that. And then um, the boundary that's left is going to be s3. And so it's an exercise to check that since y was a homology sphere, this thing is going to be a homology cobordism. Great. OK, so this is what I'm going to take to be a nice cobordism. And then Oshroth and Zabo tell us that this induces a nice map. Um, so proposition one due to Oshroth and Zabo. Um, so but w be a homology cobordism. Great. Um, for simplicity, let uh, no, I won't say for simplicity. Great, and then let's choose a spin C structure on W. Then the map induced by this cobordism from HF minus of Y naught, uh, T restricted to Y naught to HF minus of Y1. Uh, T restricted to Y1. Uh, this is a uh, graded, this uh, induces a graded isomorphism on HF infinity, which I defined um, yesterday. And so maybe the Maybe the key consequence of this proposition that I want to tell you about um, says something for rational homology spheres. Uh, so let's let y be a rational homology sphere. <coughs> well, remember, uh, if y is a rational homology sphere, at the beginning of today, I told you that HF minus always looks like uh, this, right? So this is it, there's going to be some free part and some grading, and then there's some torsion stuff. Great. Okay. And so now the exercise for you. is to use proposition one over here 
um, to show that this, this rational number here, right, the gradings take values in the rationals, um, that this gradient here, that D, um, I'll write this, it depends on, you know, Y and our spin space structure, so I'll write it D of Y S. Um, Uh, is an invariant uh, of homology cobordism. Um, so there's a few things that are wrapped up in this exercise, right? So I guess you, you, want, you should also convince yourself that this is actually well-defined, right? Because I've chosen a split in here. So you should check that this is actually that this thing that I've, claimed, I've called D, that I've claimed only depends on Y and S. You should claim this is actually well-defined. And then you should use this fact um, to conclude that, well, it's invariant under homology cobordism. And so that relies on, um, right, these cobordism maps are U equivariant. So um, that combined, that, that, yeah. So that's the exercise. Um, uh, yeah, I'm so, this commences the question part, so you can clap and then I can answer more questions. <laughs> yes. Oh, can I remind you what HF infinity is? Yeah, yeah, so HF infinity, um, this is just take HF minus and uh, tensor it uh, with, invert U. Right, so, so a good exercise in algebra would be, well, if you invert U, right, think about what happens to the free part and what happens to um, torsion stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so there's a question about this example. Um, right, so when you... When you delete this ball, it's not y anymore. So, okay, so ignore this part. But when you delete b3 from y, and then you take this product, well, if you think about what the boundary of that product is going to be, right, well, you had y. You took out a three ball with it, but there's sort of this tube here that connects it to this other three ball in minus y. And so, well, you should think about that. Well, it's basically a connected sum, right? A connected sum is you like, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, so the question was, can this, like, anything that's of this form, can that be realized as HF minus of some three-manifold? And that's, um, yeah, so the answer is no. Um, so, for example, oh, yeah, so there's also a grading here. So if you just have, like, a single F here, this is just a single F, it actually has to be in a grading that's close to D. So if you put, I, I added, the question, yeah, the question, I added a grade into your question, so you can't get everything, but it's open sort of like exactly which things you can get. Um, yeah, the question was, is there a simplest example of uh, Vashley homology coordinate three manifold so the D invariants differ. Um, so the D invariants are actually invariants of um, spin C rash. Uh, sorry, what am I saying? Um, I don't think I can give you a good answer right now. I'll think about it and say something later. <laughs> 